study. The subject is uh, <laughs> science of the gods, and um, basically uh, Peter is going to talk about some of the things that um, are written about in this book, which he is co-authored with uh, David Ash. subtitle is Reconciling Mystery and Matter. And I think as Peter goes on with it all, you will see the real significance of that title. Mystery and Matter being reconciled. Peter had a, 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 an orthodox Not religious claim, in, uh, in the Catholic mm. faith. Um, he's moved a long way from most followers since then, and we are very pleased to be to welcome you and we will be listening to what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think I'll pick you up on your offer and get rid of this. It's not going to get any cooler. <coughs> Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk this evening about some of the essential ideas behind Science of the Gods. Um, the idea of Science of the Gods being to provide a new framework for understanding many otherwise mysterious and uh, puzzling phenomena, including the spiritual. The, the whole idea of the Science of the Gods may, may strike people as pretty incongruous. Science isn't particularly known for its a sympathetic attitude to gods or, or even a single god. Quite reverse. Science has tended to cast doubt on a lot of things that happen, and it's tended to imply to people that these things only exist in their heads. They only exist in your imagination or there's some kind of illusion. Now this covers a vast range of phenomena, and you can start with fairly simple things such as telepathy or clairvoyance, and go on to the ideas of the human aura and healers who work with the human aura. The whole idea of acupuncture meridians and subtle energies surrounding the human body. And go on to talk about ideas of other forces behind nature, nature spirits, or people who experience angels, people who leave their bodies and go traveling, people who have a near-death experience, and people who claim that there is survival of the human spirit after death and possibly even reincarnation and that there is some fundamental spirit or God force behind it all. Now all of those things I've mentioned and it's come, I'm not saying anything new but these things have been excluded if you like from the main from the mainstream of our Western understanding. They're the basis of most most of the world have believed in these things for most of history but in the last couple of hundred years major question marks have been raised as to whether these things have any reality whatsoever. So this is really the framework from which we come to the science of the gods. We want to find a new framework rooted in a scientific way of looking at the world that can accommodate these kinds of phenomena, which are or have been experiences or beliefs that, 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 that mankind has had for millennia. Now, in, in approaching this, we have to divide it up really into two sections. And on the one hand, we can talk about the material world, the physical world. And this is the world of This is the world of tables and chairs. This is the world of atoms. This is the world of planets and stars. This is the world of the human body as a physical, as a physical object. Now, what would be some of the things that we would like to explain in terms of the non-material? Well, some of the things I was talking about might be these concepts of prana, 
the subtle energies, the plan and key energy of the body. Do they do they exist? Do they exist? There's no scientific evidence for them. You can't measure them with instruments. Some of the other things you might be interested in are are the human soul. Does that exist? What what is the substance of that? What is the reality of that? It's definitely not material. Anything else? Mind? Well, mind, exactly. Mind. And thought. Hmm? Now, these things do, in the case of mind and thought, they do have an analogue on this side, because we've got the physical substance of the brain. We know what the brain is physically, and the traditional view, the traditional reductionist view of science, is to explain all of this in terms of that. So that all thought is a product of, of, of material action in the brain. And the project of much of um, artificial intelligence now is to build a sufficiently complex and powerful computer that it can emulate the human brain and produce even the basic consciousness itself. But, I mean, we could add consciousness to this list. <laughs> And then there'd be a whole load of other traditional understandings that we might we might put down here. I mean, are there other realms of the universe? You know, is, are the heavenly? I'll call them I'll call them heavenly realms or or other dimensions or higher realms. Is there a god or are the gods? You know, what are they? I mean, do these things? Are these things illusions, or do they reduce to the material? Now, this afternoon we spoke at some length about the new model we're putting forward for the material universe. And for those of you who are joining now, I need to say a few words about what that model is. And this is basically by way of saying that we are putting forward a new physics, a new physics, a new fundamental model for what the physical world is. Now, what is, what is the basis of the physical world? Well, matter. And matter is organized in atoms, and atoms are, organ and atoms are made up of particles. Now, what's a particle? Hmm? It's what? Well, a molecule is made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of particles. What is a particle? Well, energy, exactly, energy. And we know, we've all seen Einstein's equation relating matter, mass M, to energy E. And what he's saying there is that in, in matter is locked up a huge amount of energy. Matter is in some sense equivalent to energy. But this essentially has been a mystery for all of this century. We know we know how to exploit that equation in the nuclear bomb and so on, but we don't know why it should be so. We don't know why there should be a relationship between a particle and energy. And this is really the starting point for the work in the sense that we're putting forward a new model for what the elementary particle is. A new model. Explaining, if you like, that equation. And the model is that of a vortex. Energy has got something to do with movement. Imagine energy as a line, a line of movement. Then as you wrap it on itself, you can form a ball, a ball of swirling energy. So that's what we're saying is all a particle is, a ball of swirling energy. And can I just take this off? We looked, we looked this afternoon at this, ba at this basic model, which you may find helpful to think of the particle of matter, <laughs> the particle, as like a ball of wool. Of course, the ball of wool is static, so really the proper model is to see it winding up or unwinding. Now, I'm, I'm summarizing these ideas very briefly. The important thing is to see, is to see that the particle is formed out of something dynamic. The particle has no, there's no material substance there, there isn't anything hard in matter whatsoever. You've got particles and separated by vast spaces in the atom, and the particle itself is nothing but a swirling ball of energy. Now, as we develop that model, we can also see how that 
part, now that gives rise to space and time. So around each particle, around each bit of matter, there's a bubble of space and a bubble of time. So if you, if that's a particle, you can think of space as kind of an expanding, expanding aura around that. So space actually arises out of matter, space is actually a diffuse part of this vortex. Matter and space are really one and the same thing. And time comes in from the movement, the movement of energy in the vortex. Now, I realize that that, that last claim about space and time may be a little bit nebulous for some of you, but um, I think if we can take that for granted and come back if you have any questions about that later. So, um, is anyone completely lost on that account? Because I've done it very, very quickly. But is there any question someone would like to ask at this point about that aspect of the physics? I mean, I've been trying to get into two or three minutes what we spent about an hour on this afternoon. Yeah. Well, that's a very good point. I mean, light is a form of energy. There are basically two forms of energy that we're familiar with in the material world. One is matter, particles, and the other is light. Now, light is usually thought of as a wave form of energy. What we're saying is, no one ever had any picture before. They had a picture of what light was, but they never had any picture of what matter was. We're saying that, 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 that matter is energy in a different form. In other words, it's in that form of the, in the form of the vortex. So there's a great parallel between them. And you could think of, actually, the vortex as light, in a sense, wrapping on itself. You could think of a particle as a little ball of light, a little spiraling ball of light. This is where we, this is where we come back to the equation, in the sense that we know that the C in the equation is the speed of light. So light, we know, travels at the speed of light. So it's reasonable to assume then that in the vertex, you've also got energy moving at the speed of light. So it's wrapping itself to the ball at the speed of light. But OK, does that answer your question at all? So let's move on from there then. Having got this picture of matter consisting of atoms, which consist of particles, and the particles each being a vortex at the speed of light. So that if I take, if I take a little square piece of wood and blow up, and I look at a tiny bit of it and I blow it up, I'll see the atoms. And then inside the atoms, I'll see the particles. Now, each particle is going to be a little vortex. Just like this. So there's nothing else in it. There's nothing else in it except the spiraling form of energy. And these are moving at the speed of light. Now, the question is, what would happen, what would happen, do you suppose, if the energy in here, in these vortices, were accelerated to just beyond the speed of light? What would happen to this? What would happen to this little block of wood? It becomes invisible. It becomes invisible. It disappears. It doesn't. It doesn't dissolve. It retains its form. The form of this is formed by the, the geometrical relationship, the arrangement of all these of all these vortices together. That doesn't change at all. It's simply the speed of the energy in the vortices that alters. And this amounts actually to a change in to change in substance. We could say that the substance of this was energy. The speeded up form of energy we could call super energy for convenience. It's, 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 it's faster than the speed of light. Now, Einstein talked a very great deal about the speed of light, and, and, and as people will know, and he regarded it as the absolute limit of our physical universe. Now, 
disagree with that, the previous description of the physical universe. When something is accelerated beyond the speed of light, it leaves the physical universe, and that's why it disappears. You can't have movement faster than the speed of light in the physical universe, as well as established in relativity. So it leaves our space and time in this process. It changes substance and leaves our space and time. And this is a, a route by which something so apparently solid could be materialized. And as I say, it's not dissolved in any way. It's not dissolved in any way. It's just gone somewhere different in the universe. Now, another, pro another term we have for this actually is this process is transubstantiation. I'll cover it. Is that right? Any other, any other German Catholics here? Anyway, this is a perfect metaphysical process that's spoken at length, spoken about length in the Catholic Church, whereby the substance of something can change, but the form stays the same. And this is a concept that Aristotle had. This process can take place in both directions. So not only could you have something disappearing, and then appearing, disappearing, as it speeds up, but if it, if it would slow down again, of course it would suddenly pop up in our space and time. Now, there are, there are many recorded instances through history of things mysteriously appearing and disappearing. From the beginning with the Bermuda Triangle. Um, now I'm not saying all of them can be accounted for by, by this mechanism, but some of them can. If you read the New Testament, there are frequent references to um, Christ addressing crowds of people. And towards the end then of his, uh, of his teaching, there's a little phrase that the Bible uses, it says that and he disappeared from, 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 from the midst of the multitude. Now, I always, as a child, had a very puzzling kind of picture about that. I thought maybe it was scurried away between the legs or... But I mean, it's actually a very, very precise term that is used quite frequently in the New Testament. And I take it now to mean that Christ was a master of this process of consubstantiation. Christ could dematerialize his own physical form and materialize it again somewhere else. And it may be that that's what he was able to do in, in leaving the apparently locked tomb. And maybe that after death he was able to reanimate his body, consubstantiate it, and reappear somewhere else. Now, I don't want to get too much into Christian teachings on that subject, but what we're pointing to is a possible framework by which these things can be taken to have a reality. Can be taken to have a reality. And there are people alive today who are who perform similar um, feats, if I can call them that. Um, the Indian teacher Sai Baba has, has, have people heard of Sai Baba? Yes. So everyone knows who Sai Baba is. Anyone know? I mean he's very famous for his ability to materialize objects and the, the, the holy ass that he produces he's now produced about five tons of I'm told in the last 40 years and he very very frequently produces gold rings and little animals and so on and so forth he himself talks about this process in several ways. Um, one, of the, one of the ways he talks about it is he talks about the size stores. Because he has these objects stored in another, in another dimension and just brings them down into our material plane. Now, if this picture holds, you see, imagine up here, you've got the thing in speeded up form. This is a speeded up form, which is better than the speed of light. And as he slows down the energy, it suddenly turns off again as a material object. And of course, you can do it in either direction. Um, we, 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 this, this line, this line I've drawn here is a demarcating line between the physical universe, the material universe, and the non-material. And we actually call it, because of the speed of light, we call it the light barrier, by analogy with the sound barrier. For many, many years, people thought you couldn't take an aircraft faster than the speed of sound, they assumed it would just straight up. 
and there has been the same kind of assumption that the speed of light is an absolute limit in our universe. What we're saying is no. What we're saying is this is an apparent limit, and that there are exceptional people who seem to be able to take the energy and matter above that speed and start to demonstrate these extraordinary uh, happenings. Sai Baba, um, you know, if you read, if you read the stories of Sai Baba, he several times has de- described as having supposedly similar disappearing acts as Christ did. So he'll be walking along with a group of people, and then he'll go suddenly see him on a hill, you know, a quarter or half a mile away. Um, and this is something he used to do quite a bit of a few years ago. So it's as if he suddenly didn't materialize as there, and we appear instantly in another place. Any questions? Well, I was going to just go on to that. Um, do you know this phenomenon of bilocation? Yeah. Yes, so Paolo Pio, do you know the story of that? Well, the one. Well, where he, um, where he, um, where he appears to be a American bomb, and he's going to, uh, to, 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 to,
He's never gone. Now, I mean, be that as it may, that there is one possible route according to this, um, according to this model of how things are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did you do that? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, no one really knows. The, the most frustrating thing, the most, he, he will do it. Some, I think he sometimes says that he does it to kind of build the faith of his followers. Um, but it's just a mystery. I mean, it's a, they're, they're parlous. A lot of these things are parlatory. And most saints, most saints who have these abilities keep quiet about them, frankly, because it's not they now approach to God, they're made a bit like their approach to God. And and they're not really very interested in walking on water and walking through walls and being omnipresent and omniscient and so on. But these things do seem to happen and, and in India they're very familiar. Uh, uh, Patanjali's uh, Yoga Sutras, there's 49 powers that advanced yogis develop or spontaneously uh, manifest. It's better, it's better, word, better word than develop because mostly they appear unthoughtful. And these are things like uh, clairvoyance and clairaudience and clairsentience and walking through walls. Yeah. Oh, a better fairy, you mean? Yeah. Well, then there's a disciple who asked his master, you know, how wonderful he can walk through a wall, why didn't he do it all the time? And he says, well, it's easier to walk through the door. <laughs> it's easier to walk through the door. But yes, and, and there are, I mean, in general, there are people, I mean, there's a way of the saint is focused on God and is aware of the sorcerer and sorcerers throughout history and tradition have sought some of these powers. So they can be developed and you can buy books in Waterstones now on how to have an out there's a whole series of American books, have a have an out of body experience in thirty days. Uh, I mean they're wonderful. But they're not perhaps the point of you know what we're here for. But do that I mean where were we? At my location. My location. These things are interesting. They're interesting pointers. The world is not quite what it seems to be. And I want to talk later about this plasticity of the world to our beingness, to our thoughts, to our creative potency, to our spirit ultimately. And I want to give you a picture of, of how it is that can be and why these things can happen in the universe. Um, but in the same vein, um, in the same vein as this, you see, people let's talk about UFOs a bit. You see, people talk about UFOs, and I mean, like, UFOs are slightly, perhaps not as it's not so hot a subject really now, and it's become more spiritualized uh, <clears throat> in the sense of people now more channeling teachings and so on from from people in spaceships, rather than a spaceship pulling a car down the road and beaming it up to sexual experiments and what have you, the kind, the kind of classic 50s and 60s, 60s phenomena are not now the mainstream. Having said that, there's a great deal of evidence that those things did take place. They were seen on radar screens. Have you seen Eva? You were nodding a lot, have you? No, I didn't. I think you're saying the most Oh, right. Yeah. But I mean, there's a tremendous amount of...
And the author suggests an answer to the fundamental, the main question about UFOs, which is, where do they come from and how do they get here? Because there's nothing in, there's no inhabitable planet or star within within tens of light years. So, well, we know we know who far you know, yeah. And so the problem always has been for scientists. Scientists say, well, maybe they come from some star system a hundred light years away. But that means that even at the fastest speed we know, it would still take them 150 years to get here. And that would be, that would be you know, quite a feat. And most of them say they come from a lot further away. And it's these, it's these vast distances of space and the vast times that it, that, are, that, 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 that it would take to travel at any, at any, at any speed, I mean, even if you could approach the speed of light, which is, which is impossible, it would take you decades to reach there. So, um, so it's yeah. Do we need a Ah, oh, yes, well, thanks, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I didn't mean to suggest that anything is travelling faster than light. It's simply that the energy, the affirmative energy, in, in them, is travelling faster. Yeah, well, Now this is no different, of course, from Doctor Who. I mean, this is pure science fiction. Mm -hmm. 
Doctor Who dematerializes his TARDIS and reappears while the warp factors and stuff. Well, yes, that, that, but, uh, that, that's exactly the same. Now, it isn't always true that what we see in science fiction turns up as science fact, but um, there are a lot of, I mean, there's been a lot of speculation along these lines. And when one puts it together with the fact that people sometimes do it and we see objects doing it, it becomes a reasonable, a reasonable hypothesis. I can't say it's anything more than that. It's just a framework. I mean, there may not be any real UFOs. It may all be some psychic phenomenon. I want to paint a, I want to paint a picture of, of you know, a scientifically based picture which allows these things to be possibilities. It doesn't rule out the, the possibility that they, that they happen at all. That's the state we're in at the moment with our, with our science. But if you, if, you, if you leave your body in a near-death experience and you look down and surgeons operating on you and you tell them afterwards exactly what went on and which instruments they used, <coughs> um, they, there is no possible account for that. There's no possible account for that. How can you see without your eyes? How can you have consciousness without your brain? So the world is a very, the world is full of mysteries. The world is full of mysteries. Some of which may be pseudo mysteries, but many of which have been reported tens of thousands of times, like the near death experience, you know, or like the communication we, we, we seem to receive from the dead. So, anyway, I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to, um, we, we can talk some more about you first. <laughs> Um, I wanted to go on, I wanted to go on, um, I mean, picking up what you're saying about other dimensions, to talk about what happens to something, oh thanks, it is quite warm, mm. what happens to something when it's transubstantiated? I've said that it leaves our space and time, but where does it go? You see, <coughs> draw the circle representing the physical universe. Now this is only a representation, it's not a map. Um, now I'm saying this is bounded by the speed of light, so that I can do it in that kind of a way that the boundary of this is C, the speed of light. And everything takes place, in the, everything, everything physical we know takes place in this conceptual space. Now, if, if, I, if, I, if Sir Barber accelerates something so that it leaves this universe, we could say that it's going to appear here. It's going to appear outside the circle of the physical universe. And it's going to appear in a realm where speeds are typically greater than the speed of light. And let's, let's draw another circle then around that, representing this realm. So this is a, this is a realm, and let's say that it's the boundary of this realm, just as the boundary of our realm is the speed of light, the boundary of this realm is twice the speed of light. So if something were accelerated, it would end up there. If it were if it moving, if it's energy, internal energy were moving between the speed of light and twice the speed of light, that's where it would be. Right? Now, let's be quite clear about the nature of this dimension. This is a dimension of speed. But it's not, it's not the kind of speed we normally think of. It's not, it's not the kind of, normally I move, I can, I can enjoy movement in, in, in four dimensions. I can move left and right and, left and right and up and down and backwards and forwards. It's three dimensions of space. So I'm separated from you by, by space. I'm separated also in the dimension of time. I mean, whoever was speaking here last month I'm, would be in the same physical location, same dimensions of space, but different dimension of time. So normally we have these four dimensions which separate us. This is the fifth dimension separating things. You can't get from here to here through space and time. If this is a heavenly realm, you don't get to it in a spaceship. The medieval picture, of course, was if you took off from the surface of the Earth, if you went down, you ended up in hell, and if you, took, if you went up beyond the, uh, 
beyond the fix, beyond the planets who ended up in heaven. We've abandoned down any kind of gross picture like that. This is a much more um, subtle picture, I suppose, in the sense that this dimension of speed that separates and links the different realms of the universe is um, a dimension of the intrinsic speed in the vortices. The intrinsic speed in the vortices. No amount of physical movement in space and time is going to make any difference. And of course one could go on to picture a whole series of these realms. A whole series of these realms. Such that if one left this realm and accelerated one's body, one would end up here. If one went on accelerating, one would end up here. And this, of course, is the same kind of picture that the, that the Bible talks about. It talks about the man who was lifted up into the seventh heaven. And spiritualists and other accounts of the universe, including the philosophical, talk about a whole, a whole number of layers of increasingly subtle um, stuff. Separate realms. And after different after death experiences, people frequently talk about moving up through these different realms, each of which has a different character. And they talk about basic realms like Summerland and so on and so forth. So these are familiar ideas, I'm sure. I'm not saying anything new here. So it could be then that the universe has a form, something like that that all of these realms carry their own space and time. Just as, just as a vortex in our world creates a bubble of space and time, so be a bubble of space and time here, a different space and time, and a different space and time there. But you see the way these three is greater than two and two is greater than one. These speeds, this, is a, this space and time would be a superset of these, of these ones. It would rather be like a set of Russian dolls. You know, in a set of Russian dolls you have a big doll, and then you take that apart and there's a smaller one inside it, and so on and so forth. And the universe could be rather like that in form. That these higher speeds include the lower speeds. So some inhabitant, some inhabitant of a higher realm of the universe might be able to choose to come and inspect our realm. Take a peek at it. We probably couldn't do that. We probably, we, most of us can't do the same. Some people can. Some people can. Clairvoyance and so on occasionally get glimpses into these realms. Now these are mainly movements of consciousness. Movements of consciousness. It's very rare that we get a physical movement. Yeah. Sorry, can I just clarify that? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about speed and changing the speed of things, and uh, the, 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 the kind of obvious standard notion of speed is you have a block, a square block, and if you apply speed and you know, motion to it, then it zooms off but in, in a certain direction. I think yeah. it, what you're talking about is, um, and, it's, and it's that kind of speed that cannot reach the speed of light. Correct, yeah. What we're talking about is you take the You're talking about displacement in space and time. In that case? Yes. No, but what we're talking about with your vortices is you have your block and it's there on the table or whatever mm -hmm. and the particles within it, except all well, aspects of the particles within it, yeah. accelerate so yeah. go, go to the speed of light. So it's not, not over there now. No. It's not outside, it's not beyond the edge of space. It's actually right. where it was before. But it's no longer discernible to people with whose vortices are moving at you know, to speed, exactly. You could room. say you could say it's in the same place. Yeah. Yeah. So it's effectively in the room. We could imagine you do another shift and it still stays where it is on the table. But yeah. Uh, and so on. So in fact, we're surrounded. We could, it could in fact be surrounded by beings and blocks. Got it. So all walking together. Yeah. Without us being Got it. Exactly. Right. That's what we're saying. That the, you see, you can't separate these realms in space and time. Therefore, the obverse of that is to say they depend.